Hi, welcome to Tets Plus. My name is Bob Flisser. If you want to choose between several possible investments that you can make, a good measuring stick is called internal rate of return. And the Windows, Mac, and web versions of Excel and Google Sheets have the IRR function to calculate it. Now, if you're saying to yourself, okay, I understand what return on investment, ROI, is, how does internal rate of return differ from that? And the answer is that return on investment, ROI, is just a plain old division. You simply take the investment and divide by the cost, and you have some lump sum. But internal rate of return takes time into account, so that when you have a cash flow coming back over time, it'll measure those. This way, if you're comparing investment possibilities, and let's say you have two or three possibilities that you want to look at, IRR can give you a side-by-side -side comparison and make everything kind of even. So you're talking about apples to apples and not apples and oranges. Now, what's nice about the internal rate of return, the IRR function, is that the cash flows do not have to be the same amount each time, but they do have to be regular. So whether it's the beginning of every year, beginning of every quarter, that's a requirement. Now, you sometimes might have an investment option where the payments do not come back at regular intervals. For that, you can use the XIRR function. With the XIRR function, not only do the payment amounts not have to be the same, but the dates that they come in don't have to be regular. We'll talk about that later on. So let me give you some info on the IRR function. Now, there are three things that you need to know. The first is, what is the initial investment? And this should be negative because it's a cash outflow. The second thing you need to know is, what is the revenue stream? And that's simply what the payments are going to be coming in over time. And the third thing is, and this is optional, is you can guess at the answer. And you might say, hey, isn't it the function's job to tell me what the answer is? Why am I guessing? And this is something that you'll rarely need. And the reason it's there is every so often the function might give you an error, maybe if some of the numbers are kind of weird. So if you're getting an error, you can simply put in, oh, well, I guess that it's maybe 5%, or I guess that it's 8%, something like that. If you don't specify the guess, the function will do its own guess and assume that it's 10% and do the calculation from there. That doesn't mean that the result will be 10%, it's just a starting point. Now, the syntax for the function is equals IRR, and then you have a set of parentheses, right? Because every function has to have at least one set of parentheses. And there's really just one argument, and that is the investment and revenue stream. So don't get confused that you can see here I said you need to know what the investment is and what the revenue stream is. These are treated as one argument. And if you're going to do a guess, then that is an optional second parameter. And one other thing. IRR is related to net present value, which is another evaluation tool you might want to use. IRR is the discount rate that makes net present value of the income stream equal to zero. And later on in this tutorial, I'll show you how you could use that information to check the result. Now, if you don't understand what net present value is, or maybe you're a little rusty, that's okay because you can watch my net present value tutorial right here on Tuts Plus. Okay, so let's take a look at our worksheet. If you're watching this tutorial on the Tuts Plus website, you can download this workbook I created for you. It's called Internal Rate of Return. And if for whatever reason you can't or don't want to download it, you could just type in what you see here on the screen. Formatting is optional. Also, you'll notice that this workbook has two worksheets. The one that we're on is called IRR, and we have some blank spaces to put in our formulas. And I also have this one that's where the tab is green, and that's with all of the answers already done. So you could look at this whichever way makes sense for you. Let's take a look at these two alternatives we have. So we have investment possibility number one and investment possibility number two. The first one, you see it's going to cost us 100,000 whatever, $100,000, 100,000 yen, 100,000 euros, whatever currency you're using. And in return for that investment, you can see over five years, we're going to get these returns. And here you can see what the total return is. Now, when we take a look over here at investment possibility number two, here you see the investment is 50% higher, and you can see that what we get back is higher, and you can see there's the total returns, obviously, is higher than the first one. Now, whereas with the first investment possibility, the returns, even though they're not the same amount each time, they're coming in at regular intervals, with this second investment possibility, we actually have specific dates that we 
think, or at least we're pretty sure that the returns are going to come back on. And you can see the dates are all over the place. It's not the beginning of every year, not the beginning of every quarter. These are just dates. So that's going to require the XIRR function. So let's do investment number one first. So let's click over here in cell B13. And I'm going to type equals IRR. Open the parenthesis. You see Excel is giving me a little bit of syntax help. Not that we really need it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to start on this initial negative 100,000. Remember, it's negative because we're paying it out. We're subtracting it. And I'm just going to select from that down to the fifth year. And that's it. I'll close the parenthesis and press enter. And I can see that I have an internal rate of return of about 11%. Okay, let's take a look at the second investment. I'll click over here and sell E13. So here we can see that, yes, this is going to cost us more. We're going to get better returns, but the dates are all over the place. So you can't really eyeball this. This is where the XIRR function comes into play. So let me give you a little bit of info on that before we actually use it. So the XIRR function is very similar to IRR. There's just one more piece of information that we need. Well, the first piece of information we need is the initial investment. That's obvious. How much are we paying for this? The second thing we need to know is what the revenue stream is. Oh, so far, these two functions are the same. The third piece of information we need to know is what is the list of dates that we're going to get those returns on. And one thing is kind of important here is let's say you know what those dates are. Don't just go into the worksheet and start typing them in because it's very likely you'll get an error from it. The dates that go into the XRR function should either be coded with the date function or it should be calculated some other way using a worksheet function. That is, the date should be in a formula or function. It should not be typed in. And then the fourth item, just like with regular IRR, is optionally if you need to guess at the answer. The syntax for the function is equals XIRR, also one set of parentheses, and there's two arguments that we need. The first, like regular IRR, we need the whole collection of the investment and the revenue stream. Then we put a comma, and then the second argument is, what is that list of dates? Okay, so let's go check it out. So back here on the worksheet, we're going to put the XIRR function here in cell E13. But before we do that, I just want to show you the dates. This is what I was talking about a moment ago. When you click any of the dates, you can see up here in the formula editing bar, I simply used the date function. Now with the date function, it simply equals date, year, comma, month, comma, day. Maybe you've calculated the dates some other way. That's okay. Just want you to know that this is not text that I typed in. Okay, so now let's go back here to E13, and I'll type equals X, I, R, R, open up the parenthesis, and here it gives us some syntax help like before. So the first argument is the values, and I'll start at that negative 150,000 and select down to payment number five. Right, that's not necessarily year number five or even month or quarter number five. It's just payment number five. Put in a comma, and now we're ready for the next argument, which is the list of dates. That's what I just showed you. And I'll just select down that list. And you can see these dates are all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason for them. And I'll close the parenthesis. I don't need to guess with this because so far it's not giving us any errors. Press Enter. And now I can see it's a 10% return. And you can see why this IRR is cool, because in the first investment, it's a lot less that we have to pay than the second investment, although the returns are a lot lower. Now, the second investment is going to cost more and yield higher returns, and I can see here by the dates that I'm going to get paid back sooner, so gee, that's probably a better investment. But no, when we do the IRR calculation, we can see, even with a lower dollar return here, that this is still a better investment by one whole percentage point than this one. Now, I said earlier that this is related to net present value, and I have some calculations for you over here, but let me explain how this works. First of all, the syntax of net present value is equals NPV, and then two arguments. You have rate and you have revenue stream. And the idea is that net present value of your revenue stream at the internal rate of return should be the amount of the initial investment that you make, although that's expressed as a positive number. The second test we'll use is this one. And here you can see I have the IRR function nested inside the NPV function. And what this means is that the net present value of all cash flows, not just the return, but the investment and the return, 
using the rate that's calculated as the IRR should be zero. So when we run this calculation, we should get a big fat zero. And when we get that, we know that the numbers are correct. So let's go try it. So back here in the worksheet, let's make sure we're in cell B16. Now I'm going to type equals NPV, open the parenthesis, and it's giving us syntax help. We need the rate and we need the list. So first is the rate, and that's this 11%, comma, and we want the net present value just of the returns. It has nothing to do with the investment, just the returns. So I'm going to start with the first year return, that 15,000, down to the fifth year return. And that's it. Close the parenthesis press enter, and hey, look at that. The investment was 100,000, and here it's telling us it's 100,000. The only difference is that this is positive and this is negative. Also, I see this is formatted a little differently. This has some decimals here, and I'll just go up here into Excel and click this button a couple of times to get rid of the decimals. Also, that has a dollar sign. I could click this comma, actually click that decrease decimal a couple of times so that the formatting looks the same. You notice that this is giving me a little bit of an error. You may or may not get this. This is simply saying, when I click on here, it says the formula is emitting adjacent cells. Excel doesn't really understand what's going on here. It says, hey, you're selecting the second number in the list all the way down. How come you're not selecting the first one? It doesn't really understand what I'm thinking. So I'm simply going to click here, ignore error. By the way, if you click that ignore error and then you do the calculation again, <laughs> the error is going to come right back anyway. Okay, so let's go down here into cell B17. We'll do the second check that I mentioned before. And here we're going to check the net present value of all the cash flows, not just the returns. So we'll say equals NPV, open up the parenthesis. So the rate is going to be the internal rate of return. So I'm going to say IRR, open up the parenthesis. And it's in the initial investment down to the fifth return. Now I'm going to close the parenthesis for the IRR function. And now I put on a comma. So first thing I did was the rate. I was calculating the rate. And now I need the values. The values of the same thing. So I'm just going to select the same cells that I selected a moment ago. And close that outer parenthesis. Press enter. And now I've got a big fat zero. Now, the formatting might look a little strange. This is actually formatted as a negative number. And you might be wondering, well, where on Earth or any other planet do you have negative zero? Well, that's just a quirk of some rounding. There's probably a whole lot of decimal points in there. And the worksheet is probably just rounding a whole lot of decimal points. And that tends to cause some errors. But don't worry about it. Zero is zero. Also, I'm not going to run these checks over here because they don't quite work with the XIRR function. If you try it, you'll get all kinds of weird results. So when you want to evaluate the quality of investments returns over time, a good measuring stick to use is internal rate of return. And that's what you use when you have a regular set of cash flows that will come in at regular predictable times. When the returns will come in at predictable but irregular intervals, then use the XIRR function. That way you'll get meaningful results that you can compare with each other. So I hope you like this tutorial and it'll help you make a lot of money. So once again, I'm Bob Flisser and thanks a lot for watching.